we pray once more before we begin and open God's word together? Father, in that song, we confess your holiness, your greatness, and we do adore you. We also know that you're present and personal with us here. We ask you to speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know uh, how many of you listen to podcasts, uh, but I would recommend one to you. It's called uh, Unbelievable. It's in Premier Christian Radio. It's uh, out of the UK. It's a great little, it's about an hour long, and they, they do a great job of interviewing skeptics and believers in science and in apologetics and in life and um, and so I just enjoy that sort of thing, and it, it's a very fair uh, podcast, and so I listen to that fairly frequently. And I was listening to it recently, and uh, on, the, on the show they had a guy named Athol Shaha, and he's an atheist. He's a physics professor and an atheist, um, and they were talking about his atheism, and it's a little bit different. He's not objecting uh, on scientific data to the existence of God. He said, I don't see the existence of love in the universe, and so... I, I don't see the existence of God, this loving God that Christians talk about. And as you dug into his life, he was very honest, and he said, you know, um, the only time I really experienced the love that really could transform your life was through my mother, but she died when I was 14, and from that point forward, I just really haven't seen it in the universe and in the world, this, this life-changing love. And he made, this an atheist saying, all people need love, love that would transform their heart and change their lives. And he's exactly right. I almost felt myself, I don't I'm just listening to this guy, recorded podcast, just... Um, Sad for him, longing for him to know the God who, who made him and loves him and wants, to know, wants him to know his love. Keep that story in mind because it gets at what we're going to be speaking about as we continue in our series, our uh, theme, the story of Jesus. And this week we're looking at, we're kind of going backwards from last week, Pastor Bryant's preached to us on the temptation of Jesus. We're looking backwards now at his baptism, the event that came before the temptation. Um, as these two events are key in the preparation of Jesus, which is the series we're in called Preparation. In order to understand his baptism in its context, I want to read the broader scope of that story and where it took place and what went on so that you get a sense for all the things that were kind of behind it, and then we'll try to unpack it together. If you have your Bibles, open to Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, or you can follow with on this giant screen behind me. Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire." I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased." Such an amazing text, and it's, uh, there's a whole bunch in there. But I want to give you a little geographical background first so we get the sort of our bearings uh, f- uh, for what's going on there so you'll have a sense of where these took, events took place and why that matters. You'll see on the map here behind me, uh, in the north, uh, Capernaum and Nazareth, the green dot to the left, that's where Jesus grew up as a boy, you see that? And then south along the Jordan River to Jericho and Jerusalem there, we're almost straight south of Nazareth. 
Now to get from Nazareth in Galilee, that, the region of the north around the Sea of Galilee is called the Galilee. It's named that way. Galilee comes from a, an Aramaic word for the waviness of the mountains there. It's, the, it's the, the region of the wavy mountains, the Galilee. That's where Jesus came from. He would have traveled east to the Jordan, south down the Jordan River Valley, and then uh, back west again to Jerusalem if that's where he was going. But in this case, he stopped in that red circle there. That's the area in which most uh, scholars believe John was uh, conducting his ministry, baptizing and living in that region of the, of the wilderness. And so you get an idea for what's, or where things were taking place and what was going on. It's very interesting, I think, and important for us to note that only two of the gospel writers um, record anything about the birth of Jesus. We get it in Matthew and in Luke. We all we celebrate the birth. And I, not the, it's the incarnation. It's a very important event in our faith. But only two of the four gospel writers talk about the birth. All four mention the baptism of Jesus, and yet I don't think we pay a whole lot of atten attention to that. We don't give it perhaps its due. So let's, let's begin by asking a couple of questions. Who is John? For those of you that may be newer to uh, studying the Bible or reading the New Testament, John here, John the Baptist, is not the same guy who wrote the Gospel of John or the letters 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. This is a different John altogether. One of the most fascinating characters, I believe, in all the New Testament, and right up there with many in the Old Testament as well. He's the son of a priest named Zechariah and his wife named Elizabeth. Elizabeth was a distant relative of Mary, the mother of God. We don't know how distant. They were cousins. Were they second cousins? We're not told. They were relatives. So they were connected somehow, Mary, mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth, mother of John. We get that in Luke chapter 1, verse 36. So John and Jesus are related. Uh, second cousins, once removed, whatever that means, I don't know, but they were somehow once, they were related in some fashion. Uh, Jesus, John's birth was also foretold by the angel Gabriel, the same one that appeared to Mary in Luke 1, uh, 11 through 19. And so they had both had miraculous births of a kind. John was to have the Spirit of God on him and to turn many of the children of Israel back to God. Malachi chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there to Malachi 3 or uh, the last of the prophets, the Italian prophet Malachi. Ha, 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 Groan. Anyway, Ma uh, Malachi 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now flip to Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. This is what we read about in Luke chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. We get the, uh, the fulfillment of this prophecy. John, the Baptist, is the one in many places in the Old Testament referred to as the one coming in the spirit or way of Elijah. The one coming before the one. There's one coming, Jesus. He's the one. He's the Messiah. But all throughout the Old Testament, we get little hints of somebody who would come before him to prepare God's people for him. To help them prepare their hearts and prepare the way for the Lord. So from an early age, John seems to know who he is and have some sense that he was set apart by God for a very special purpose, to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. And by the time Jesus arrives, John's been out in the Judean wilderness for about six to eight months doing his thing. He's growing in popularity. We read that people in the whole region are flocking out to him to hear his message about the kingdom of God and to be baptized by him. He's a different kind of cat. He wore a camel's hair tunic. He was not out to make a fashion statement. That means he wore very uncomfortable clothes, like a shirt that went down to his knees, a leather belt. Doesn't mean it was like a fashionable belt. It means like a piece of leather tied around his waist. That's what he wore. He ate locusts, bugs. You ever see the locust shells on your trees after they've all died? He ate those things. And wild honey. I think John would have been fantastic on those reality shows on TV now for about surviving. Like John would have been like, no problem, bring it on. 40 days, that's the start for me. I live out there. Anyway, we have no record of Jesus and John ever meeting uh, until the baptism except one time. Do you know when that was? In the womb of all things. Mary went to visit Elizabeth when they were both pregnant, Elizabeth further, a little further along. And, and the story says in Luke that when she got there, that the baby in Elizabeth's belly, John, leapt for joy at the coming of the Messiah. He already knew in the womb had some reaction to the presence of Jesus. Now, we don't know if they ever hung out between that meeting in the womb and in the Jordan River baptism scene. They may have, but we don't know. But I like to imagine 
uh, when I was studying this a couple weeks ago, I was thinking about what would it be like if Mary and Elizabeth, after the boys have kind of grown up, got together and were reflecting on their sons. You know how moms do, talk about their boys, right? Can you imagine it? Mary, Elizabeth, hey, how are you? How's Zechariah? Oh, he's, you know, he's a pain. How is, how's your son? How's your boy? John? Yeah, how's he doing? He's odd. I mean, he's very odd. You know, he doesn't live with us anymore. Where does he live? In the wo- out in the, in the desert, in the wilderness. Why? Mm, you know, I make him clothes, he won't wear them. I make him food, he won't eat it. He's just a very strange young man. And then Elizabeth says, Mary, how's your boy? Mm, perfect. <laughs> he's perfect. <laughs> like all moms think this, but she'd be the one mom in history who'd be right when she said it. He is, what mom could resist that? If you actually, mom, you're all wrong, by the way, about your kids. They're not perfect. But Mary was right if she would have said this. And of course, I'm just imagining. We don't know. Regardless of whether or not they ever met as children or that this sort of thing took place, John knew that his mission was to prepare the way of the coming of the Messiah. And in John chapter 1, we realize he doesn't know for sure who this is until he sees this moment of baptism. We'll come to that in a few moments. Let's look at Matthew 3, verses 1 through 6 here again. The first few verses. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John came wearing a garment of camel's hair and leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. They were baptized by him, the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Notice that people went out to him from Jerusalem, the whole region, were going out to be baptized in the Jordan River. Now, some of you may have had the privilege of traveling in Israel and seeing the Jordan River. I don't know what you think about in your mind when you imagine what the Jordan River would have been like. Uh, Maybe you think about the Mississippi River or the Amazon River or the Fox River, but it's probably not like you imagine it. The Jordan River is 105 miles long. Here's a picture of it at its narrowest point today maybe 10 to 10 feet across, at the, at five, five feet across at its narrowest, 10 to 15 feet deep at its deepest, at its widest point, maybe 100 feet across. Here's a picture of it, a little bit wider, one of the more wider, uh, faster flowing areas. The Jordan River, river is stretching it quite a bit. It's 105 miles long if you go straight south from Ga- the Sea of Galilee, straight south to the Dead Sea. It's 105 miles long. If you float down the river, it's two, over 200 miles long because it meanders, it winds all over the place. It's really not much of a river in most places today. Most of it's siphoned off for irrigation. In fact, in Israel today, there's a campaign to restore and replenish the Jordan because they are using so much of it in that arid country for irrigation. But even in Jesus' day, it was not a giant, fast-flowing, massive river. It was really more of a large stream. You'll see a picture here of me standing in the Jordan River at the spot where they believe the, the, the baptism took place. They don't know, but they picked a spot near in the area. And I'm standing in the Jordan River. I tried to take a bottle of Jordan River water back from Israel, but the people in the airport frowned on that and took my bottle away from me. Anyway, so John's well known in the region, and people are flocking out to him to hear him, to be baptized by him, and he was called John the Baptizer. John, the one who baptizes. That's his nickname. So he's the only guy doing this. Otherwise, the name makes no sense, right? If he's, not, if he's John the Baptizer and there's a whole bunch of guys doing it, he's, he's that crazy guy out there, the one baptizing people. That's, it was utterly unique what he was doing. There is no other wilderness prophet at this time in Jerusalem doing what John's doing, saying what John is saying. Let's ask the question, what was John's baptism? What was it for? Now, it did have some ties to Old Testament practices. In the Old you may have wondered, like, where did the whole baptism thing come from? Well, why did we do this, and where did it come from? In the Old Testament, there were uh, mikvats, and those were even present in Jesus' day, ceremonial baths. You can see the re- remains of these outside the temple in Jerusalem today, or in some of the desert communities built these things, where Jews would stand about waist deep or chest deep in this ritual bath and pour water over their head. It was to make themselves ceremonially or ritually clean before they would go to the temple or offer sacrifices or come into a t- the uh, the um, the synagogue, or, or to come into the presence of God in any way. And then if there are uh, references to Gentiles, non-Jews, Israel, non-Israelites, being baptized in order to become a, a, a Jew, to convert to Judaism. But all these things are really not what John is doing. He's doing something utterly unique. He's taking this symbol of, and he's, his baptism is totally radical and new in a couple of important ways. Uh, in Matthew 3, verse 11, we read that he, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. 
um, water for repentance phrase. In Acts, the same thing in Acts chapter 19, verse 4. We get the same issue happening here, being baptized in water. John's baptized involved full immersion. The Greek word for baptize is baptizo, and it literally means to dip or immerse, dunk. There were no sprinklings going on. John is plunging people beneath the brown waters of the Jordan. And it's for confession of sin. We read that earlier, right? They're coming out, confessing their sins, and being baptized by him. It's for forgiveness. And in verse 10, it's also for escape from God's judgment. He says, who warned you to the Sadducees and Pharisees to flee the wrath that is to come? So that's the picture, right, of what's going on in John's baptism. Confess your sin, repent of your sin, be baptized, and, and to, to prepare yourself for the coming of the Lord, the great and terrible day of the Lord. It was simply put, a baptism for sinners. Now, Jews in that time viewed God's wrath and God's judgment as reserved for the enemies of God's people. God is wrathful and he's angry and he's going to judge those who are not of his covenant family, non-Jews, Gentiles, in other words. But here comes John saying, God is coming and he's going to judge you too. And you better get ready. And he keeps using this word, repent. Repent. I, I can't say that word without hearing like a Southern Baptist preacher in my head, repent. That's not really what John probably sounded like, right? He, he says, it's a churchy word. We don't use that word in today's, in your common language. And it's got a negative connotation. But I think sadly, we miss the real significance of what that word means in our Christian faith. And I want to try to unpack that for you. The word is metanoio, and it means to change your mind and direction. It implies a 180 of your heart. So in other words, your mind, your heart are headed in exactly the wrong direction apart from Christ. To repent means to recognize this is the wrong way. I need to change, turn around, and face the right direction, namely the Messiah, the one who is to come. Um, John is preaching this message. It's the first word of the gospel in many ways. Robert Murray McShane, a Scottish Presbyterian minister from the early 1900s, late 1800s, said this message, repent, is the first word of the gospel. It's the first word of John's message for sure. It's the first word of Jesus' gospel, Matthew 4. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come upon you. And the first word of his disciples' message in Mark 6, verse 12, they sent out preaching repentance for the kingdom of God is coming. And the first word of Peter's sermon in Acts 2, verse 38, repent to be baptized, he says. And of Paul's message in Acts 26, when he says, you need to repent of your sin and be baptized. Over and over again, we get this word repent. It's an attitude. An inclination of the heart. It's not simply ceasing to do certain things. That's important. Oswald Chambers writes, It is not repentance that saves me. Repentance is the sign that I recognize my desperate condition apart from Christ. And I realize my need for what God has done in Jesus Christ. You hear that? Repentance is not just stopping doing certain things that displease God. Repentance is recognizing my desperate and hopeless condition apart from Christ and seeing what God has done about that condition in Christ. So John's main message is not, you need to repent because you're all a bunch of worthless sinners. It's God is coming. His chosen one is coming. And you need to get prepared. And the way you do that is turn around because you're heading the wrong way. In your hearts. Okay, but if this is true, if it's a baptism for sinners who need to be forgiven, why did Jesus get baptized? You ever, you ever wonder that? Why did Je the sinless Son of God choose to be baptized a sinner's repentance? If he had no sin to repent of, what was he doing in the Jordan? This actually has been a troubling question for early church and early Christians. If Jesus was, in fact, the perfect sinless Son of God, and if John's baptism was to repent of sin, why in the world would he submit to this? Doesn't it communicate exactly the wrong thing? Why would he need to or even want to be baptized by John? John himself gets this, doesn't he? He would have prevented him. He says, hold on, time out. You should baptize me. Not me. You got this wrong. In fact, we can contrast how John responds to Jesus with how he responds to the teachers and the Pharisees and Sadducees, Right? They come and he says, who warned you to flee? And he refuses their baptism. Why? Because he knows it's a show for them. Their hearts are not in it. Keep, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Meaning, it's not just about the outside. It's about repentance of your heart. 
And I know your hearts aren't right. And Jesus comes and he refuses for a whole different reason because his heart is pure. His heart is perfect. Some have tried to explain Jesus' baptism by claiming that he was simply affirming John and his message. Hey, it's my second cousin. He's a good guy. I think he's got good things to say. This is my way of acknowledging that John's all right. I don't think that quite gets it. Others have said, well, he was setting for us an example to follow. He was showing us what we have to do. Yes, but. Others have said, well, he's, it's his initiation into his public ministry. He's baptized, goes into the wilderness, and after that he kind of goes public with his ministry. None of these, I think, are adequate explanations of what's really going on when Jesus is baptized. So let's let Jesus himself explain it. At the risk of getting it wrong, let's look at what Jesus himself says about it. Look at verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee, in the north, remember, to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. So in other words, stop there. Jesus didn't just happen upon this. He, he intentionally, willingly, purposefully came to John. He didn't, wasn't strolling along outside Jerusalem. Oh, look at that guy. Let's see what he's doing. He came down from the north in Galilee for this reason. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. There's the reason. Then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. To fulfill all righteousness, he says. It's, the, it's fitting. It's, it's necessary. This has to happen. I came for this reason. What reason? To fulfill all righteousness. Well, what does that mean? In other words, this is something God requires of me, and my life is to do absolutely everything God requires, starting with this baptism and leading all the way to the cross. I'm going to be perfectly obedient to the Father. So even though technically I have no sin to repent of, I'm going to be obedient to my Father and, ex and enter into this baptism, and it's going to lead me straight to the cross. Philippians 2.8, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And I think it begins here in the Jordan River. In being baptized, Jesus allowed himself to be what Isaiah 53.12 says, numbered among the transgressors, right? He was counted among the sinful. He is identifying himself with sinful humanity, with us, by entering into those waters. Numbered among the transgressors because he's going to pay for our sin. This is the perfect obedience of Christ, of the Apostle Paul. And I hope you don't miss this. This is the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ for you. You cannot be perfectly obedient to God because we are sinful like I am. But one is perfect on your behalf. And the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 says, this is, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on, for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus says this step and every step following all the way to the cross and the resurrection is necessary to fulfill all righteousness because you're unrighteous, so I'm going to be perfectly righteous for you. And then when I die in your place, miraculously, God, what the scholars say, imputes, gives to you the perfect record of Jesus. So that when the Father looks at you, he doesn't see your messed up life. He sees the perfect life of his Son and all of his obedience. That's beginning here in the Jordan River. Isn't that amazing? I believe it's not a stretch to say that Jesus had you and me and us and all in mind when he entered that water. Let's ask this last question then. What does Jesus' baptism mean for us? We've already hinted at this. What does it mean for us? Well, first, we can't skip over this. We could spend weeks on this, but we'll touch it briefly. It shows us the Trinity. I've had people say, perhaps you've thought this before, Trinity, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. That's true. It's not in the Bible. But the concept, the Trinity, maybe not the term, but the Trinity is all over the Bible and nowhere more, more visibly present than right here in the Jordan River. You have the Son in the flesh, second person of the Trinity. You have the dove, the symbol of the dove, the Spirit descending on the Son, the Holy Spirit. And you have the voice of the Father, Father, Son, and Spirit, saying, this is my beloved Son. 
So people ask you, well, where's the Trinity in the Bible? Take them right here to Matthew chapter 3. It's really kind of a coronation ceremony for Jesus in a sense. The heavens are opened. By the way, when it says when he comes up out of the water, that doesn't mean he climbs the bank of the Jordan. It means he was raised up after being baptized, right? Buried with Christ in baptism and risen with him. When he comes up out of the water, John raises him up, the heavens are open. It's the same word opened that is used later on in Matthew when it, at his death when the temple curtain is torn from top to bottom. It means the heavens are not just kind of, it doesn't mean the, the clouds gently part. It means there's a rending. Right? What's the what's the the prophet Micah say? Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Well, he has. He comes out of the water, and the heavens are ripped open. There's a violence in this word, torn apart. And then we're told the spirit of God descended on him like a dove. Now, I want to be clear about something. It is not teaching us that the spirit is a dove. It's not saying, the, the, when you see a dove, that's, it's not saying that. I know you have doves on your Bible covers and doves on your doilies and on your magnets, on your whatever else you have. But that's not, that's wonderful. It's a symbol of the Spirit. But what's it really teaching us here about the Spirit of God? Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Isaiah 42, verse 1, My chosen one, in whom my soul delights, in him I have put my spirit. John 3, 34 tells us the spirit without measure is given to the Messiah. The the Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will have the full presence and power of the spirit without measure. You and I only get a measure, and it's more than enough for us. He gets the whole thing. What is this saying to us? How does a dove descend? Like a bird of prey with talons out, screeching? No. Gently. Do you see the beautiful contrast? The heavens are torn apart and the gentle descending of the Spirit on him. Resting on him. It's tender. It matches the voice. This is my beloved son. I'm well pleased with him. Finally, let's look at the voice. The voice from heaven. My beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 6 says that Jesus Christ is the exact imprint of the nature of the Father. Father now is saying, this is my son. He's the one. Clearly, this is the unique status and position of Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless son of God. But here's the amazing thing. Let me preface this by saying this. Last Sunday, before I preached this sermon, I got up really early like I do on Sunday mornings, and I had my coffee, and I was walking down the steps to my basement to my study where I sit and look over my notes and drink my coffee before I head off to church. And on our steps heading down, if you're in our house, is uh, these three pictures my wife has put together that are of our children. You know, there's a little toddler picture, super cute in the middle, and around them are every school picture from, you know, first grade all the way to to senior year. And so Noah's are all filled in because he's away at college now. So I I stared at that and I thought, it's like a microcosm of his time in our home. You know, parents, how that feels. Just, oh, he's, you know, it's all filled in. And then my daughter has one blank left because she's a senior in high school, so her picture's not up there yet. And my son Benjamin, he's got a few spots to fill in. And I just started, I just stood there on the stairs with my Bible in my hand and my coffee in my hand, looking at my pictures of my kids and feeling this, um, maybe I was just overtired, but feeling this uh, overwhelming sense of just love for them. I want them to know they're my beloved son, my beloved daughter, my beloved son, you know. Not just that I love them. I so desperately want them to know that their Father in Heaven loves them. You know, I got all kinds of dreams for my kids. I'm sure you do for yours. But what, what, I, what it comes down to is I want my children to know. I want them to hear God's voice in their mind and heart, right? You're my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter. What child of any age doesn't want to hear that? Doesn't need to hear their father say, I love you so much. I'm so proud of you. You're so precious to me. I'm so pleased with you. Can you imagine God saying that to you? Or do you, like me, sometimes go to, yeah, but I have really made a mess of things. Or I've, I've screwed up so much. Or I'm, yeah, I know, I know, technically he loves me, but the perfect, sinless son of God from the Jordan River to the cross and to the empty tomb, is your, it's because of him that God the Father can look at you and say, I love you so much. I'm so pleased with you. I'm so proud of you. You're so precious to me. If that sounds scandalous to you, good, it is, but it's true. I felt like God told me on those stairs, not that the heavens didn't open and the voice didn't come to me, but I did feel as if God said to me, Jeff, don't miss that. 
Don't get lost in the Jordan River in the background and the history because that's what I want them to hear. I want them to hear that because of my son, I can look at them and say, I love you. You're my beloved. Henry Nowen wrote a book called uh, The Life of the Beloved. And he said, our greatest and most difficult task our whole life on this earth is to believe that we really are the beloved sons and daughters of God in Christ and to live in light of that truth. We fail at that every day. I think he's exactly right. Not long ago, I had an opportunity to do a funeral for a man uh, who I didn't know very well, but I knew his family. He was an elderly gentleman. And I wanted to get to know, you know, you do a funeral for, the, for someone who you know the family of. I wanted to hear his story. And so they talked to me about his life. And he grew up very poor, achieved a great deal in his life. And they told me wonderful stories. One of the things that struck me was they said that his father was horribly abusive and angry. A really angry, desperate, mean man. And eventually abandoned the family. And that anger, abuse, and abandonment marked him his whole life, although most people didn't see that because he was pretty good on the outside. And he was having real trouble when his kids were young. I mean, he was in real, a real dark place with anger and depression and anxiety. And this is before people went to counselors very often, you know. And he, he, uh, his, his boss, who was a believer, said, I want you to go see a friend of mine. He's a psychiatrist. He refused and resisted because that meant you're going to see a shrink. Something's wrong with you. He wouldn't do it. But finally, he consented at the risk of losing his job. He went to see the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist said to him, I, don't, I can't help you, but you need to go to church. <laughs> what psychiatrist today would say that? You get sued in some states. Go to church. He, 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 he did go to church with his wife. He found the love of Christ there, was baptized there. His life was transformed. Years later, he sought that psychiatrist out and said, why did you say that to me? And the man said this to him. This is what, all coming from his children to me. The man said to him, I just knew you needed to know how, that you were loved. I just knew you needed to know you were loved. Now, don't miss that. A psychiatrist told a man to go to church to find out he's loved. Do you think the church is where people think they should go to find out their love today? I hope so. I hope we're a place where people feel like this is where you go to know that you're loved, that God loves you. And that knowledge of a father who loved him transformed his life. Friends, I, want, I don't want you to leave here tonight without, without hearing that. That because of the perfect sinless son of God, the father in heaven can look at you and say, you are my beloved son my beloved daughter, I'm so pleased with you. Your heart needs to hear that. Your life needs to be lived in light of that. And when we witness baptisms today, the reason we baptize the way we do is because that's somebody who's come in contact with that love and been transformed by it, dying to their old self and being raised with him. So what better way to finish our time than for you to watch a, a, a brief recording of our most recent baptism service and then for us to worship God together.